there are two groups that I am particularly passionate about being in the midst of and sharing the information that I learned um, through my research. And that is folks who are in law enforcement and folks who are in healthcare. Because the results, the consequences of a white supremacist society are most dramatic and most obvious within those two fields. Um, and so with that, let's dive right in. I have lots of information. Let me forewarn you, you're in for a bit of a history lesson on the front end. Um, and I promise you, I'm going to be bringing in information that seems disparate and unconnected. I promise you, I'll thread it all together um, for us. We can't begin without acknowledging that the earth that we're standing upon today is stolen land, taken land. Um, could we call out the First Nations in our, locally, our local First Nations? We're all sitting here together. <laughs> Can you call, call out our, our tribal names? And the tribe is? Muscogee Nation of Florida. We're huge people. Muscogee Nation of Florida. Thank you. OK, thank you for being here as well. All right, you all ready? Well, I thought I was born an expert. I'm white, right? It was a label attached to me from the second of my birth. And yet, it's the thing I have known the least about. Um, and we have to change that. You want to understand something about this culture we live in? You have to begin in the 1600s, in colonial North America, specifically in the colonies of Maryland and Virginia, British colonies. These two colonies shared a number of characteristics, uh, one of which is that they both had an economy rooted in tobacco farming. Secondarily, they both had an incredible gender imbalance, roughly um, 8 to 12 men for every woman. I know some of y'all are thinking, let's go back in time, <laughs> right? If you know anything about tobacco farming, you know that it requires incredible human labor. And so the large plantation owners um, had a regular, uh, a continual need to replenish their labor supply. Lucky for them, uh, there was a population boom in England in the early 1600s. And um, that meant that there were lots of people who did not have employment, who couldn't feed themselves or their family. Um, and so this is when the workhouses um, emerged, and so poor people were swept off the streets, tossed into workhouses, children as well, where they labored until their death. And so the King of England was pretty happy to have these um, people swept up instead and put into the guts of a ship where they would be sent off to the so-called New World um, to labor. They came via a contract called a term of indenture. I think it's also really important that we realize, um, are there any lawyers in the house? Well, a, a critical component that we learn in contract law is that a contract requires agreement on the part of both parties. Here, here's how these so-called agreements were entered into. You're either imprisoned for life or enter the contract, right? Uh, you're in a workhouse for life or enter the contract. So it puts um, choice into, into doubt. So many, uh, most of the workers who were in these colonies um, in the, for the first half of the 1600s were um, poor British people and largely poor British men. They came via a term of indenture, which was roughly um, 5 to 14 years, was the typical time frame. It's important to realize that indentured servants in the colonies were treated very differently than indentured servitude was um, structured and handled in England itself. For example, in England, indentured servants could marry because they saw that as a means of producing the next generation. However, not true in colonial North America. And if a, a female were um, unfortunate enough to become pregnant during her term of indenture, Nine years were added on, and one to the man. The other piece of indentured servitude as it took shape in colonial North America 
um, was the treatment of uh, British citizens who were indentured. We know from letters written um, by visitors from, from England that they were absolutely shocked and appalled at the way um, British citizens were treated. Um, and this, in fact, is a, a drawing from that time period. You see that uh, British citizens were brought off ships with ropes around their necks and arms. And um, this was shocking to British people. And I quote here from the historian, the famous historian, actually, um, uh, from the University of Chicago, Edmund Morgan. And he notes that indentured and enslaved persons were sold and traded like cattle. Laborers in law, of course, were not all equal. Indenture was for a term of years, and it was protected by British law. Slavery, however, was for life. When I first wrote this book, there was still a debate raging in academia as to whether the first um, persons of African descent who were brought into Virginia were in fact enslaved or free. It, was, it, it raged for decades. And it was finally resolved um, th about three or four years ago now um, when the manifest of the ship um, was found in Portugal. And so they were, uh, the captain of the ship did claim the group of African men as enslaved. So slavery, of course, um, was neither prohibited nor restricted via British law nor international law. The socioeconomic structure at the time in these colonies um, is really not unlike today. I should make it clear that this image is terrible because it really doesn't reflect visually um, the truth of the matter. But the truth of the matter is really not unlike today, where we have the 1% in possession of over 90% of the wealth and the 99% with very little. And the distance between the two, which is, which is greater today than it has ever been in this nation's history. That, I'd have to stack 100 um, ladders on there and I couldn't fit it on the slide, so just so you realize. So we have the landholding elite um, representing in today's parlance the 1%, and then the 99%. And the vast majority of the 99% um, were British, um, and specifically British men. The records also show folks from um, Portugal, um, from Ireland, Scotland. Uh, there were a few Dutch, not very many. There were members of native tribes, a very small number, and stolen men, women, and children from Africa who were enslaved. Oops. Here's what's important to note. This is perhaps the part of this presentation this morning that is most surprising to my audiences. And it was to me as I um, uh, did this research. It was not uncommon during this time period for there to be free persons of African descent. How can that be when they came enslaved? Well, here's what the historical record reveals. The, the number one route to freedom for enslaved African people um, was by having a side job that enabled you, and, and here's also an important piece of information. Um, many of the first people of African descent who were brought into these colonies came from Barbados. And so, which was already a British colony. So they spoke English. They were familiar with British customs. Um, they were certainly acclimated to the weather. And they had been engaged in sugarcane farming, which was even more arduous than tobacco farming. Um, so that group came in with incredible skills that were quite valuable um, to the plantations. On the other hand, the vast majority of folks who came from England, well, what did they come with? Not many skills um, that were useful on a plantation. You couldn't even drink water in England at the time. That's why everyone was at a pub. Right? It was so filthy, so dirty. Um, and so they, had, and they were not well acclimated to the weather um, and certainly not to the work. So the number one route to freedom 
was by having a side job and purchasing one's freedom and that of family members. The second route that the historical record reveals was through wills and trusts of plantation owners. Again, poor British men constituted the masses within the 99%. It's important to note that all free men, whether of British descent or from Africa, had the same rights and privileges as a matter of law. That meant free men of African descent could vote, and they did. They could own enslaved persons of African descent, and some did. They could own indentured servants, and some did. They could run for public office, although I can't find a record of anyone who chose to do so. Furthermore, they could um, marry a person of the opposite sex regardless of her nation of origin, and they did with abandon. In fact, in one county in Virginia, 50% of the free men of African descent um, were married to British women. And don't forget that gender imbalance. The historical evidence, actually, let me take a step back. I just want to address the gender component here, right? Because we're just talking about free men. So let's bring in why that's the case. The law that established the parameters of relationships between men and women at this time is called the law of coverture. The law of coverture emerged out of feudal England, um, and it really wasn't contested until Seneca Falls in the um, 19, late 19th um, century. The law of coverture is described by the famous barrister in England called um, Barrister Blackstone in this way. He says that in marriage, the two are made one, and the one is the man. And quite literally, as a matter of law, that was the case. And so let me concretize that. That meant as soon as she said, I do, she is not recognized in a court of law. Zero recognition in a court of law. So a woman could enter into a contract. She couldn't craft her own will or trust. She had no right to her own wages. And if she were sexually assaulted, her husband had the claim. So we get a sense of the law of coverture. Now, some of y'all are thinking, well, why the hell would anyone get married? Well, the fact of the matter is that the um, parameters that constructed relations between men and women in marriage, called the law of coverture, in fact shaped how women were treated in the society as a whole. And so it was very, it was exceptional um, for a woman to be able to do what she needs to do to survive without a man. You can see how the legal arrangement made you dependent on a man because you couldn't do anything on your own. The law of coverture. So shifting back into um, the very important fact that free persons of African descent had the same rights and privileges as free British people as a matter of law, the other thing that is um, important to note is that persons of African descent and British descent who worked on the same plantation were treated the same. There was no hierarchy on this plantation. The only separation was along gender lines. So that meant people from Africa and England ate together, slept together, worked together, lived together. Marriages between uh, persons of African descent, largely men, and uh, women of European descent, largely British women, uh, were largely accepted by the masses. I really thought I was going to find some evidence that suggested um, that these marriages were viewed in a negative light. Uh, but I, I, we have not been able to pull one piece of even anecdotal evidence. So here's the kinds of things that you look at. What we did was we looked at people who were um, in business for himself, who married a person um, who was a, a marriage between a British person and a person of African descent. 
So what we would expect to find if the community viewed that marriage in a negative light, you would expect at least a dip in their income, right? If the community's like, yeah, we do, we do not approve, so we're gonna go to this lawyer instead of that lawyer, we're gonna go to this shop instead of that shop. We don't find that, even if only a temporary one. Not a single example. Furthermore, at the time, not unlike today, women um, outlived men, and so it was not uncommon for women to marry multiple times. So you might expect, if the marriages were viewed in a negative light, that a woman, um, uh, a woman from England who had been married to a man from Africa, that she may find it difficult to remarry to a person of British descent. And again, we don't find evidence of that at all. These marriages um, uh, continued and women um, married without any kind of conflict indicated in the record. There was resistance to these marriages, but it did not come from the masses. It came from the ruling elite. This is a painting of the uh, Maryland lawmakers. And in 1664, they passed a law that punished, quote, pay attention to the language, British and other freeborn women, unquote, who marry enslaved Negro men. So the consequences for engaging in this marriage were really severe. The woman who marries an enslaved Negro man is enslaved for the duration of her husband's life, and any children that they have are enslaved into their 20s. They explain in what's called the dicta of the law, the rationale for passing the law in the first place, that the purpose of the law is to um, prohibit these, quote, shameful matches. They further state that these um, British women are forgetful of their, their status as English women. And they state, remember this as well, that the British are deserving of rights and privileges from which others can be denied. So imagine that you're a plantation owner. What do you think about that law? Woohoo, right? Your property value, as soon as she says I do, your property value just went up. And so the opposite of the expressed intent by the lawmakers is in fact what happened. Um, and it is not until 1681 that lawmakers amend this law, and this time they get it right. What happened was plantation owners were encouraging the marriages to increase their property value. Um, and so this time, the law reads, and I quote, British and other white women, end quote, who marry enslaved Negro men um, shall... The, a similar punishment, but this is how they got it right. Did you hear the language? Right, good. Um, so the language um, of the law has changed, and that's what we're gonna dig into next. But this time they got the law right, because this time they punished anyone found to have helped encourage the marriages, and the person who performed the marriage was also punished. So this one had the um, desired effect. This body of law, that this law of 1664 is, if not the first one, then is certainly the precursor to, is called anti-miscegenation law. I, I speak to seventh and eighth graders um, about this history, and if they can say, what did Mary Poppins teach us? Yeah, if we can say that, we can say, Anti-miscegenation. Can you do it with me? Anti-miscegenation. Excellent. So this body of law um, is critical for us to understand. Why is that? Because it lasted more than 300 years. More than 300 years, literally shaping the faces before us and that move around us. Anti-miscegenation law 
was an invention of colonial North American lawmakers. The vast majority of laws were just a replica of British common law, not true with anti-miscegenation law. Anti-miscegenation law are laws that made it illegal for white people to marry various groups seen as not white. Every single anti-miscegenation law prohibited white people from marrying people of African descent, every one of them. Then, depending on the demographics of regions, the laundry list continued. I read in history books all the time um, anti-miscegenation law described in this way. These laws prohibited interracial marriage. That's not quite right. Because a person, an indigenous person, seen as racially distinct from, say, a person from China, both understood as racially distinct, never did anti-miscegenation law prohibit that marriage, ever. Anti-miscegenation is about whiteness. Anti-miscegenation um, concerned white people. The laws, the anti-miscegenation laws, were um, finally, in 1967, found to be unconstitutional um, as a violation of the 14th Amendment. And the, the wonderful case title is Loving versus Virginia. That was the case that went to the Supreme Court where the court ruled it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. I know that y'all can't really see this. It's for me more than you. Um, so I wanted to, we've been talking a little more about Maryland and I wanna bring Virginia into the fold here. So Virginia passed their anti-miscegenation law um, in 1691, and their law um, prohibited white men and white women from marrying persons of African descent and members of native tribes. But lest I leave you thinking that gender equality prevailed in Virginia, let me quickly dispel that. Here's what we know from historians, and we know this from um, Peter Bardaglio's work from uh, Cynthia Bynum, one of my favorite books called Unruly Women, um, and Laura Edwards, three historians, all of whom um, do their research during the antebellum period. And what their research reveals with regard to anti-miscegenation law is that in, Vir in Virginia and in other states that had anti-miscegenation laws, lots of white men were violating the law. The, the four corners of the law. They were engaged in these marriages, in these relationships, but rarely were they prosecuted. When they were prosecuted, this is the line crossed. They dared to treat their non-white spouse, bless you, in a way deemed only appropriate for a white woman in public. That's what would land them getting prosecuted under anti-miscegenation law. Uh, so we see that anti-miscegenation law was focused and concerned with controlling the relationality and the sexuality of white women and non-white men, particularly African-American men. So the question becomes, what happened between 1664 and 1681 that explains this new word referencing people called white people, and the answer is Bacon's Rebellion. Let me just set the, the context for this rebellion. It was really the perfect storm. In Virginia, that supply of ready laborers that kept coming in from England, the indentured servants, the, the replenishment supply, died out by the 16, late 1650s. And so the large plantation owners were absolutely panicked about how they were going to replenish their much needed labor supply. So what they did was they began to impose extremely harsh punishments on the laborers they already had for really minor infractions. So they'd add, if, if one had a term of indenture for five years, they'd get nine added on for stealing a pig. And, and other sorts of infractions. So the treatment of indentured servants um, became much harsher. The other thing that happened, 
um, is that the price of tobacco dropped. The king gave most of the good land to his buddies. So even if you were lucky enough to survive, to, to purchase your freedom or to survive indenture, there wasn't a lot of um, opportunity once you um, were no longer working for another person. And even if you were lucky enough to find and afford a piece of land to farm, um, it was becoming increasingly difficult to compete with plantation owners who, didn't had, who had a labor force that they didn't have to pay at all. This represents the moment in time just before the sharp turn to the terrible um, trade in stolen, kidnapped um, people from Africa. So this man, Nathaniel Bacon, he didn't have to look very far to find a bunch of disgruntled people in the colonies. And so there were two phases to Bacon's rebellion. The first turned on tribal people surrounding the colony of Virginia um, because Bacon was furious with the um, political leaders in Virginia because he believed that his neighbors had been killed um, by Native Americans. Imagine that. They thought their land was taken, right? But he, coming from his perspective as um, a Brit, um, a Brit with power, um, was outraged that they were killed and that the um, governor failed to take sharp action. So the first phase of Bacon's uh, rebellion was um, against a focus against um, Native American people. The second phase focused on the ruling elite. This rebellion was enormous. It lasted well over a year. More than we know from records written from the um, lawmakers in Virginia to the legal oversight authority in London, that more than uh, that their perspective was that more than 30% of the people in the colony supported the rebellion. Britain sent in troops and that ultimately worked to quash this rebellion. The rebellion sent ripples throughout the British colonies. And the ruling elite um, were vulnerable, felt a vulnerability that they had not experienced before. How do we know this? We know this from the work of Theodore Allen. Theodore Allen's research um, digs in in great detail into these written communique going back and forth between lawmakers in the North American British colonies and the legal oversight authority in London, which reviewed all laws of the British colonies. And it's in these letters that he reveals um, that these um, leaders in, in lots of colonies in North America were really traumatized and frightened because of Bacon's Rebellion. And here's what else we learn from that written communique. We learn that the Virginia lawmakers tell them, don't worry, we've got this under control. Because remember, Virginia is a corporation, so it's the shareholders in England who are feeling very insecure about their investment. They say, don't worry, we've got it under control. And they reveal that they will pursue a divide and conquer strategy. Oops. And in the decades following Bacon's Rebellion, we see in the legal record a mass of laws getting passed and asserted. Now don't forget, up until this moment in time, free people of African descent and free British people face the same rights and privileges as a matter of law. Those who work on the same plantation receive the same treatment. They work together, eat together, sleep together, and that day ends. These laws ensure that that social organization would never, um, would, would be completely shattered. This is an example of some of the very first laws that were passed. One of the first laws um, prohibited free blacks from running for public office, which obviously they could or you don't need the law. Um, black uh, 
um, persons of African descent and members of native tribes are prohibited from marrying whites, the anti-miscegenation law. Whites are required to be paid goods, including gun and powder, upon completion of their term of service. Contrast that with the next law that prohibits free blacks from possessing a weapon. And then a law is passed that prohibits persons of African descent from testifying against white people. The law of 1681 represents the first time on planet Earth that there is a reference to a group of humanity called white people. There's lots of evidence of discriminated against groups across the planet throughout history. None of them were discriminated against in opposition to whiteness, because whiteness has never existed until 1681. Y'all are about to get little buttons that say 1681. And so when people ask you, you have to be able to give them a great answer, right? So it is the first time in law there is reference to a group of humanity called white people. So let's look at this. We have this, imagine what that must have been like. Here you are, um, and yesterday you were British, and today, lawmaker, and we don't have cell phones, telephones, texts. Most folks realized the new social arrangement when they went to work, because law required now that white people, this new group of humanity called white people, be in a position of managerial authority relative to all others. So the plantation re was required to be restructured. If you were not in an area where this restructuring of society was apparent, these laws, this bundle of laws, were required to be read two times a year at church on Sunday and on the courthouse steps. Let's look at what it must have been like to find oneself now a white person. How would you know who's white? It's clear from the language of the law that British people are white. Is anybody else white? And what did it mean to be white? Well, let's look at this one law. Let's look at um, the prohibition of people of African descent testifying against white people. What's the message to white people? You can treat people of African descent however you wish right? And not be held accountable. Excellent. Look what else this one law function to do. Well, first, let's get the flip side of that coin. And what did people of African descent learn with just that one law? You better be passive, right? You better be passive and submissive relative to white people. Look at the function of this, just this one law, that it functioned to align the law with whiteness. Do you see that? It aligned the law with white interests and perspectives. Now that law that prohibited white people from marrying, excuse me, um, prohibited blacks from testifying against whites, that law, that law worked. And the reason I know it worked for its purpose, the divide and conquer purpose, um, is because we see it throughout US history. After the US um, signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and this half of the room yesterday were Mexicans living in Mexico, and today are Mexicans living in the US and you didn't move, um, what we saw emerge in those regions uh, were laws that made it illegal for Mexicans to testify against white people even though by virtue of federal law, you were white. 
craziness. But the function of the law, which um, is multiple, there are multiple functions, right? Because it aligns the law with white people, white, white interests, white perspectives. And it also works to render those who are made vulnerable by that law um, to keep them in that position of vulnerability so that they are rendered cheap and dependent labor. We also saw laws um, uh, emerge over on the West Coast um, soon after um, gold was discovered in 1848 and we had um, uh, men of Chinese descent who came over to work to build the um, transcontinental railroad um, and pan for gold. And once again, we saw laws emerge, and actually it was a Supreme Court decision in the state of California that began it, um, finding that Chinese could not testify against white people. Right? So we know that law served its purpose, kept um, certain groups, cheap and dependent labor, and, and pacified masses of white people. Um, and we'll look at that in a second. So let's look at the reorganization of colonial society that the invention of white people constructed. The lawmakers who asserted white people and this bundle of laws that gave meaning to them, they didn't have to hand over a pence of their wealth to do this, to get a group on their side, to literally now have their army to protect them. Don't forget, Bacon, this is on the heels of Bacon's Rebellion. They didn't have to hand over a pence of their wealth. What they did was they dug a new bottom to society and shoved people of African descent and members of native tribes within it. The other function of this reorganization of society um, was probably unexpected and quite brilliant. If there's one thing that the 99% could all agree on uh, prior to Bacon's Rebellion, it's that we hated them, the 1%. There was just shared despise for the 1%. But now, now there's a group, a, a large group of laborers called white laborers who share something with this elite and that something is a status called white, imbued with the presumption of shared superiority. So a, a link is now made and I see this in my classroom still today. I have white students who have a greater affinity with Melania Trump and Paris Hilton than to their African-American, Hispanic, um, uh, Native American neighbors. That tie um, via whiteness is incredible. So what do we say about this thing called white people? What does this history tells us, tell us? It tells us that white people were built upon the idea that the British had of themselves as white, as Christian, as deserving of rights and privileges from which others can be denied. Listen to that again. Deserving of rights and privileges from which others can be denied. Not a far step from white supremacy, if much of one at all. So we see that white people, we were invented to divide us. And we have served that purpose ever since. White was imbued with a presumption of superiority from its very first assertion in law. We also saw, via anti-miscegenation law, that whiteness served as the center of patriarchal power, right? Because what was the function of anti-miscegenation law? It made white women exclusively available to white men. And then as a matter of when you fold in enforcement practices, you see that all women were made available to white men. <laughs> 
We of course know that in 1681, well, let's ask this, my scientists. Um, was there a genetic shift that took place in 1681 that now links British and Dutch and Portuguese into a genetic sludge we can call white? No, it's ridiculous. Of course not. It is an invention. This thing called race is about power. And the white so-called race is about domination and exclusion. Y'all doing okay? Okay, we're gonna jump ahead 100 years, okay? So, 1681, uh, the first time in law there is reference to a group of humanity called white people, 1681. There is a break with Britain, the Declaration of Independence is signed, um, and a brand new country is constituted called the United States of America. And in 1789 and 1790, the very first Congress of this brand new republic are tasked with um, passing all of the laws of a brand new country. Included in those laws um, are those concerning immigration and naturalization. Naturalization is the legal process that one must follow when you're not born in a country and you seek to become a citizen. That's naturalization. And our founders of this country determined that in order to become a naturalized citizen of the United States of America, one has to be white. The requirement of being white to naturalize a US citizen was built in a feature of naturalization law for more than 150 years. Making whiteness more important than the gifts and skills one could bring into a nation, more than one's love of freedom and liberty and opportunity, whiteness was the cornerstone. In fact, we had, a, I apologize, I can't remember his name. Um, I believe it was Roosevelt's administration. He, um, he ended up quitting um, because there was only one other country in the 1930s that had racial restrictions um, on immigration. And that country would be Germany, right? That our, our laws regarding immigration and naturalization were more aligned with Germany um, under a Nazi regime, regime than any other place on the planet. <clears throat> so, so I know that my time is running out, so let me wrap up here. <clears throat> this, the assertion, the requirement of being white to naturalize, its impact um, bled out into so many laws um, and, and so many policies shaping this nation. Um, and so I'll just give you a, a few examples of, of that. We know that in the Dred Scott decision, uh, and in that decision, the Supreme Court found that people of African American descent were not in fact, even if they were born here, were not in fact citizens and had none of the rights of citizenship. And part of the evidence that was submitted via amicus brief to the Supreme Court was um, the naturalization law of 1790. Right, because the, the law itself reveals that the founders never intended for non-white people to be citizens. What is the import of citizenship? Does it really matter? Citizenship gives access to political voice. So without citizenship, that right to vote goes away. And so communities who, were, um, who wanted to express the needs and desires of their people for their families uh, were unable to do so because they were excluded from citizenship via the law of 1790. And then, remember all those Chinese immigrants who came? 
Well, we, uh, immigration law only allowed men to come. Anti-miscegenation law prohibited them from marrying white women. So we see we've denied them political power via the law of 1790. We've denied them patriarchal power via anti-miscegenation law and immigration policy. Um, and so in all of these ways, we work to keep them cheap and dependent labor. Laws began to be passed over, out on the West Coast that included um, a police tax, um, a foreign wage tax. They were already the lowest paid doing the same job. White people were paid more. Chinese were paid less. Same was true for um, Mexican workers relative to white workers. On top of just starting out being paid less, we see that um, the status of being an alien kept these um, communities from gaining access to, to any kind of power, social power, political power, patriarchal power, even just within a family. Um, and so it became, as I already mentioned, illegal for Chinese to testify against a white uh, person in 1913, with California being the first state to do so, they passed alien land laws. What these, and listen to the language of the law, because you wouldn't know it's about race, what's going on here. These laws prohibited ownership of land for a person ineligible for naturalization, right? Which means not white. Um, and then a year later, they made it illegal for them to even rent land. Right? because the white um, farmers didn't want to have to compete. Um, and so that's what those are about. So y'all are getting buttons, and they say 1681. Why is that date important? Yeah, it's the invention of white people in law. The very first time there is a reference to a group of humanity called white people built in law. So I know we're going to shift into some Q&A. And I'd, I'd like to share a couple. If y'all can imagine, I, I did this research quite some time ago. And my whole world was rocked. What does this mean for me? I have this label attached to me from my birth. Like, What am I supposed to do with that? How do I be? There weren't, there weren't white affinity groups in the 90s, right? I was crushed. Um, and so I, I guess I'd like to, to share how I came out of that um, as a white person confronted with this history. Um, I definitely fell into that guilt. And here's what I know. I know that guilt may be an inevitable feeling and maybe even a healthy feeling. Uh, but it does nothing to change the structures that still express white superiority and give me daily advantages. Nothing. So what I encourage people to do um, who may be feeling guilt is to choose empowerment. Choose to be empowered. And oftentimes, uh, People of color, especially persons of African descent, walk away from this history um, with a wide range of feelings, um, but a very extreme one being extreme anger. Understandable. I would again encourage choose empowerment. Choose empowerment. I hope that this information um, helps you as you go forward with your careers. Because one of the workings of whiteness, which is really built in white superiority, when I use that terminology, whiteness, it means built in structural white superiority. One of the features of whiteness is that it seeks to blame you as something being wrong with you. And now you know, which you knew before, now you know even more, that it was set up 
for you. And any time you are brought in to be the one diversity person at your hospital, at your clinic, um, you, we have to turn it around to the structures. How is the structure causing X, Y, and Z? And we know history that established that structure. This country promoted white supremacy as a matter of founding law. I didn't choose it. I was born into it. Doesn't change the fact that I don't get incredible advantages today because of it. And that I have, a, a depending upon one's moral um, guideposts, it places, I believe, incredible responsibility on those of us um, who are white today. So I'll conclude with one um, story before we move. Oh, y'all can hand those out. That'd be great. Yeah, everybody put some at the table and let people grab them. Um, so you're, you're getting, as I mentioned, little buttons. Um, and my hope is that lots of people are going to say, what's the deal with 1681? And then you're going to share that with them. And if you ever need help, because you're like, man, I forgot some of those laws. Where was that? Um, there, this outline, there's an outline of this lecture available for anyone. I make my students log into it. Um, and it's, um, it's called a free e-course on my web page. And so you just go to bat, uh, jbattalora.com, and it'll, it'll come to you. And I use it for purposes of teaching in my, in my classes. So with regard to whiteness, um, I think it's valuable to share um, this particular story. So I was in graduate school at Northwestern um, in Chicago, and I remember so much about this day. In fact, it was, it was early December because the radiators were clanging. Anybody lived up north? You know, those clanging water radiators are going. And I had had a really rough day at the university. Um, so I came home, and I just wanted to check out. So I turn on the TV, and CNN is on. And so the news tells of about five or six white people who had been killed that day on a, on a commuter train in New York. And I remember being so upset as I'm watching the... Um, uh, journalists interview uh, the people who were on the train and then family members. And I just, you know, I had tears in my eyes and I kept thinking about, my God, like those, those children will not have a parent coming home and their parents will not have a child coming home. And two days pass and I came home again wanting to check out, you know, you'd think I'd learn not to turn the news on at this point. So I turn on the news, and the headline is about uh, three people of African descent who had been killed. And I got up and boiled water to make pasta. And while I'm waiting for water to boil, I have the first conscious recognition of my life that something's wrong with me. I felt no empathy. I didn't wonder about the children who didn't have a parent coming home. I didn't have tears welling in my eyes. I did not have empathy. Empathy is one of the cornerstones of the measure of health of a human being. I didn't realize until much later in my work um, around whiteness and law that whiteness did that to me. Whiteness has damaged our humanity. Absolutely it's true. And so that's a personal example, and I'll conclude with a social example. So y'all remember the 1980s? There was a, um, a, a addiction that was raging. What was that too? Crack cocaine. And what were the communities disproportionately impacted? African-American communities. And how did we, the people of this nation, respond? Incarceration, incarceration, incarceration. We have an epidemic today. And what's that? Opioids, heroin. And which communities are disproportionately impacted? White communities. And how do we respond? 
I'm with the right crowd here. <laughs> right? The, we are responding with compassion because we can see white people as frickin' human beings, but not others. The evidence of the damage whiteness has done to white people is in fact everywhere. So bring that healing with you. And I wish you all the best as you go out there.